Hello, hello, and welcome to the Holistic Fitness Podcast, where you'll learn how to get your goals without burning out. I'm your host, Laurie, and this show isn't just about movement and nutrition. You probably already know that exercise and nutrition is important for your mental and physical health and well-being. It's also about stress management, mindset, shedding those limiting beliefs, and working through some of that childhood trauma while you're at it. Today, I'm joined by Karen Biesta. Karen Biesta is a certified health and lifestyle coach who works with women over 40 who want to transform their bodies and their lives. She is the founder of Welligant Women Coaching and host of the podcast Welligant Women Redefining Midlife, which is currently ranked number nine in Apple's list of the top 50 midlife podcasts. After going through her own midlife reinvention, Karen is passionate about helping women in midlife to age powerfully create extraordinary health and vitality and make each new decade better than the last. I am so excited to chat to you, Karen. How are you today? Hi there. I'm good, Lori. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I um, I just love chatting with people who are in their midlife and constantly getting better and better and using that wisdom to be the best they can. I've had a, had a few people that chat about midlife on the podcast, so I want to just first understand more about why you help people in the way you do today. I feel like everyone has a backstory and you alluded to it in the intro that I just wrote wrote out. So what context would I need to know about your life to know why you help people in the way you do today? So my, you know, I tend to think a lot of people in this wellness space sort of came to it because of their own struggles and their own challenges. And that was certainly the case for me. I, I was certified as a health coach back in 2012. And I went through a two-year certification program. I loved it. I developed some really healthy habits and everything was fine. It was better than fine. I felt great up until 2017, um, which was a year I like to refer to as like the perfect storm in my life, because not only did I, at the age of 48, start experiencing um, the symptoms of perimenopause, but it was the same year I ended a 24 year marriage. So Ooh, if you can imagine it, yeah, I mean, I had this ma- these major physical changes and challenges happening. At the same time, I had these major, you know, changes and challenges uh, around my divorce. So all I knew was that I just felt terrible pretty much all the time. I wasn't Mm. sleeping. I had really bad anxiety, which at the time I did not know was a symptom, is a symptom of perimenopause. I assumed that that was just due to my emotional circumstances. Um, It it became, I, I was feeling so awful, but it became hard to identify whether I was feeling awful because it was my body's, you know, response to this perimenopause, um, you know, response to the hormones declining or whether it was through the, because of the emotional stuff. And so I sought out help the way we do when we don't feel well, right. We go to doctors, we go to therapists, we go to, you know, acupuncture, whatever it was that could possibly help me trust me. I explored it. And, and I have to tell you, I did not hear a lot of empowering messages. I heard a lot of doctors say things like, well, you know, this is what happens when you turn 40, you know, once you pass that, that, that age hormones are, are fluctuating and this is what it feels like. Um, I heard people say, you know, well, this is just what happens as you get older. Uh, you know, even therapy did just, it didn't really, um, move me forward. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that out of frustration, that if I couldn't find the expert that I so badly needed, somebody who could deal with both the physical and the emotional in a way that would help me kind of get out of this this dark time, um, then I needed to become that expert. So I went back and took some advanced certifications in women's wellness. I learned everything I could about hormones and hormone balancing and the female body over 40. Um, I also really deepened into thought work and life coaching and learned that, which was new to me. Uh, And within a period of, you know, uh, probably within a period of a year, my whole life transformed. Um, And I saw the power of not only, you know, addressing the hormone imbalance, but I saw that just how powerful our emotional health is at this particular time and just what a close connection 
it, you know, our emotions have to what's going on in our bodies physically. I think we all hear about the mind body connection, but to be honest, there, there was nothing like perimenopause <laughs> to, to drive that point home for me. Um, and I began to see that I really could not attack that this problem without looking at both of those things together. And that's really, you know, that really formed the basis of my work because my work really is a unique blend of both health coaching and life coaching. It's, you know, I like to think of it as, as, you know, addressing the whole woman um, in, in that kind of holistic way, instead of saying, well, you know, here's a symptom, let's treat that. You yes. know, nothing, nothing happens in isolation, as we know. Um, so that's, that was really powerful in my life and in, in the lives of, you know, so many of the women that I work with. Absolutely. To me, that sounds so wild that you went to so many experts that have been studying for decades, like therapists, doctors, and you're getting all of these reactive kind of symptom orientated uh, advice or, or medication or what have you. But you went off and studied some advanced courses and hormones and studied some life coaching and thought work. And within a year, your life had turned around. Mm -hmm. What's the disconnect there? What are we not focusing on enough? Well, I I think this story just highlights it beautifully. And, and this is absolutely a true story. I went to my doctor at one point and she was asking me about the supplements I was taking. Now this is, you know, after I was already certified as a health coach, I mean, I, I was knowledgeable. Mm. So I, I started listing out the supplements that I was taking and she asked me why I was taking each one of them. And I started listing out, you know, what each supplement was addressing. And she said, Oh, you know, hold on just a moment. I want to write this down. And I just had this moment of like, wow, like I'm, I'm sitting in a doctor's office. I'm going to her for advice. And, and she's actually looking to me for advice in terms of, you know, the, the supplements and in, in our conversation, in the context of our conversation, she, you know, very honestly explained that they just, she just received very little training in nutrition and supplementation in medical school. Mm -hmm. um, and, and she, you know, is a young doctor. I mean, I, you know, I, we're not talking about somebody who was educated like in the dark ages. I, I just think that really that's the root of it. And, and to answer your question, I just don't always, you know, I, I don't have confidence that every medical professional is educated enough in things like nutrition and supplements and, you know, holistic uh, medicine. I think functional medicine is an area where, yes, you can, you can find people who are knowledgeable about that. But I think for me, it highlighted the fact that we really all have to become our own advocates because the people we are turning to don't always have the knowledge and information that we need. Absolutely. And it's a lot of pressure to put on a doctor as well, to be an mm -hmm. expert in fitness, to be an expert in functional medicine, to be an expert in everything else they're an expert in. And, and there's a lot of uh, specialized medicine. And that is a great story to illustrate that. So mm -hmm. what was your fix in your story? Was it nutrition? Was it fitness? What helped you with both the perimenopausal symptoms, but also your mm -hmm. emotional symptoms through like a highly uh, significant event in your life? Yeah, um, I, I definitely had to, um, I, I came to the realization that taking care of ourselves is no longer a luxury. That is a necessity. Um, I had to make that front and center in my life. Um, and, you know, like all of us, there were, there were times that it was, and there were times that it wasn't, but I had to really um, make that top priority. And, and it started with nutrition. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I love all things wellness. So, you know, fitness, supplementation, stress management, all of it is important. I mean, if, if, if we look at, you know, life as a table, right, it's resting on, on these legs, sleep support, stress management, fitness, and nutrition. Um, but I think I, I really do believe that food is medicine. And um, when I began making changes, uh, I, I saw almost immediate results in the quality of my sleep, in, you know, the severity of my symptoms. Um, and, and, and I have to say, nothing I did was like very drastic. You know, these mm -hmm. were, these were small, manageable 
changes that fit within the context of my life because I was not in a position to do an overhaul of my life. That would have created more stress and probably worked against me. So, uh, you know, I was aware of what I could realistically do. And I just, you know, built upon, you know, one change upon the next, upon the next. And, and as I said, you know, it, it, within a short period of time, I saw my symptoms improve and, and I just felt better. And, and there's nothing like feeling better to motivate you and create discipline. Because, you know, when once I started feeling better physically, once I started getting a little more sleep, then I started feeling better emotionally. I wasn't exhausted all the time. I wasn't, you know, feeling that intense anxiety all the time because my nervous system was beginning to calm down. And a lot of that had to do with, you know, moving toward an anti-inflammatory diet, mm -hmm. cutting out things like caffeine, alcohol, you know, things that I knew were contributing to my anxiety. Um, and, and mind you, I never drank a ton of coffee. I never drank a ton of alcohol, but, you know, even just the little bit that I was having was exacerbating some of my symptoms. So when I really started paying attention to the way certain foods felt in my body and, and how they related to my symptoms, just that awareness was so, um, important because I really began to learn the effect that different things had on my body and on my symptoms. And even just that piece for women is a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Just slowing down enough to say like, wow, how, how do I feel when I wake up in the morning? And what am I doing in the moments before I go to sleep? And how does, you know, having that glass of wine at dinner affect my sleep that night? We just, mm. we're so busy that we're, we're just not thinking that way ordinarily. But when I, when I tuned in um, and started paying attention, it was really amazing, you know, how, how much I could learn just by understanding, you know, what I was putting into my body and then how that was affecting how I felt. Yeah. That makes total sense in terms of just figuring out how things feel in your body because everyone's body is so different. Like what's one person's, I guess, what causes stress and anxiety for one person is totally different to the next. How do you help people pay more attention to that and pay more attention to themselves? Like, do they need to journal, meditate? Like, what does that look like tangibly? You know, and I think it goes back to what you were saying. I think it looks different for every woman. Um, I think a big part of it is is experimenting you know, mm -hmm. experimenting with meditation. Uh, some people can do it, you know, first thing in the morning and some people absolutely can't quiet their mind and they just, it, it ends up producing more anxiety <laughs> than it, than it, um, you know, than it alleviates. So I, I do think that every person really has to figure out for themselves, for themselves, what will help them to kind of slow down. Um, it, it also means looking at your calendar, you know, and, and that's not something we like to do. It's not something we think of as being a wellness practice. But I think that managing your time and making sure that you're not overextending yourself and you're not, you know, constantly feeling like you're drowning um, is, is crucial because we really cannot um, take charge of our wellness if we're operating in that state of constant overwhelm. And, mm. and it's epidemic in our culture, right? Like, I don't know if there's a woman that I've ever spoken to that hasn't, you know, told me how overwhelmed and busy she is. I think, you know, if, if we really look at just that piece where we're undermining our health in so many ways by not managing that overwhelm and what I learned as a result of all my training in life coaching is that those feelings of overwhelm it, they're all coming from thoughts in our heads. You know, mm. it's just our, our thoughts that create feelings of overwhelm. And I don't, you know, nobody ever told us this, right? We, we think that overwhelm is a function of our calendar and overwhelm is a function of what's happening around us. But a big part of this work is taking our power back and understanding that we have the ability to control how we think about mm. things. And yes we can reframe our beliefs around aging, around perimenopause, around our health and well-being, around our calendar and our obligations 
you know, we can put ourselves back on our to-do list, um, but it means addressing some of the thoughts we have, some of the guilt that we've been conditioned to feel when we take time for ourselves and when we prioritize ourselves. So mm. that's why I say, I, you know, the two are so closely related. And if we want to manage our health, we also have to unpack some of these unconscious beliefs we have around, you know, our health and our well-being and and prioritizing ourselves. Yes, you're so right. Overwhelm is such a reality for so many women. And um, whether we do it to ourselves or whether it is external, like those are two different things. I'm curious about this uh, this kind of pattern interrupting with regards to your thoughts and your unconscious beliefs. How do you even begin mm -hmm. to get started with that? Well, I, you know, I think it's unpacking um, the thoughts that underlie our feelings. So when we when we're feeling overwhelmed in the course of our day, you know, if if we can begin to kind of tease out what are the thoughts that are creating that feeling of overwhelm, um, and and how can we change them ever so slightly to just feel a little more empowered? I think so much of overwhelm comes from the feeling that things are outside of our control. Mm -hmm. And I think that the more we can very slowly begin to kind of move the needle and begin to think thoughts that that give us that sense of control, the better we are. And the, the thought that I love to practice both myself and with my clients is, you know, everything is a choice, right? We, we, we like to say we have to do this and we should do that. We give all of our power away when we do that, mm -hmm. because the truth is you are choosing to do this or that, right? Nothing, you, there is nothing that we have to do. Everything we do is a choice. So I think it's, it's super empowering when we really begin to remind ourselves. And sometimes it's a moment by moment <laughs> kind of a thing, you know, like it just, it doesn't happen naturally. Sometimes it's, we have to keep coming back to it and keep reminding ourselves, everything is a choice. The same way everything I put in my mouth is a choice. You know, everything I put on my calendar is a choice. Everything, you know, that I do or don't do comes down to my choice. So what choices am I going to make today, you know, right now in this moment that will help me to not feel overwhelmed later on. And yeah. that's, that's, I think, how we begin to shift it just by, by recognizing that we have the power of choice and that's a tremendous power. And when we realize that we're always at a choice point and we begin to take back that power and we begin to make choices, you know, bit by bit by bit that move us in the direction we want to go, it becomes easier and easier to do that. So that that really, I think, is the starting point for people is just that one recognition of the fact that, you know, we always have the power to choose. Yeah, you're so right. Even if the, yeah, and I think we do speak in I have to's a lot instead of I get to's a lot. You know, mm -hmm. I have to go to the gym or I get to move my body. Not everyone can do that. Lucky me. Yeah. Um, and you literally don't have to do anything. You don't mm -hmm. have to go to work. You don't have to do your work. Yeah, there's, right. a consequ there's a specific consequence of that. Um, you don't even have to follow the law if you don't want to. <laughs> but That's right. we we literally can choose to do whatever we want to do. And and then you took that a step further of it. It's deciding what you want and ensuring that mm -hmm. the choices that you make align with with what you want. Yeah, and and it's it's you know another great way to do this work is to I love to use the idea of my future self mm -hmm. to motivate me now and to inform my choices now. Um, you know, I I I often use the term aging powerfully. I don't like the term aging gracefully. Um, okay, you know we hear that a lot. Yeah, and for me it has a certain tone of resignation in it. Okay. Like, well, I can't control this. So I'm going to, I'm going to just do it gracefully. I'll just do the best I can. For me, you know, I don't want to just do the best I can to get through something that seems inevitable. I want to take control of it and manage it in a way that makes me feel powerful. So I like to think about aging powerfully. And one of the strategies that I use a lot is, I think about the woman I want to be 
in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. You know, I think about her and I think about what does she do and what are the choices she makes and what does she value and how does she care for herself? And I try to let that inform the choices that I make today. So you were you were saying, you know, we don't have to do anything. Every choice we make has consequences. So I like to kind of reverse engineer it and think, well, what, what is it that I want later on? And then, you know, back it up and figure out what are the choices I need to make now so that I can have that, so that I can age that way, so that that's my experience of life as a, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 year old woman. And yes. it's really powerful when, when we stop thinking that the best years of our lives are over that the best years are 20s and 30s. You know, when we break out of that sort of outdated way of thinking and we think about the future as being full of possibility and full of opportunity, it really does change the way we live now because we have now this vision guiding us. Are you tired of constantly feeling burnt out while trying to achieve your goals? Do you find yourself struggling to maintain motivation and productivity over long periods of time? I'd like to introduce you to the Goal Getting Journal, the ultimate solution for those of you who want to surpass their goals without burning out. Our journal is designed to help you set achievable goals, track your progress, and maintain a healthy work-life balance. With our journal, you'll discover practical strategies for managing stress, staying motivated, and avoiding burnout, including time blocking, habit stacking, and so much more. You'll also learn how to prioritize your tasks and maximize your productivity so you can get more done in less time. The Goal Getting Journal is perfect for anyone who wants to achieve their goals without sacrificing their mental health and well-being. Whether you're an entrepreneur, a student, or just someone who wants to make any positive change in your life, the Goal Getting Journal can help you stay on track and avoid burnout. And for Holistic Fitness Podcast listeners, you can get 20% off your first journal using the code HF podcast. Go to goalgettingjournal.com and type HF podcast at checkout to get your discount. So what are you waiting for? Order the Goal Getting Journal today and start getting your goals without burning out. Yes, I love that. And I love the phrase aging powerfully. And it makes so much when you explain it like that. And personally, when I turned 30, I, people say like, even at 30, people say, oh, 20, like your twenties are the best years of your life. You know, everything goes downhill after 30. Mm -hmm. I didn't accept that because I'm like, I do not want to be 20 again. I don't want to go through all of those lessons. Like I was so stupid. I was smart in many ways, but I don't want to go through the, like the, just the stuff I worried about Mm -hmm. at 20 at 30. And then I think about it. And even as I was speaking to you earlier, I'm thinking, wow, when I'm 40, I'm going to be even more smart. And I'm going to be like, I don't want to be 30 again. That's right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering like why, I wonder why people stop and kind of have that resignation because of their age. But my question is to you, what does the world look like if everybody ages powerfully, everyone has this mindset throughout their life? What, what do you think would change? I I just think people would be so much more content. People would feel, you know, so much happier because they are designing their life. You know, and it's, and it's like you were saying, we truly do get better with each decade. I think part of the problem is that, you know, we live in a youth obsessed culture. We live in a culture that tells women aging is bad, or at least, you know, you shouldn't look your age. You shouldn't reveal your age. You shouldn't, you know, I, I think, I think there are lots of rules placed upon women over 40. You know, you, you need to dress in a certain way. You need to look a certain way. You have to act your age, you know, and I think, I think we have those, you know, a little bit of that conditioning that we need to unravel. So that's, that's one reason why I think we develop this mindset that our best years are early on. I think the other thing that happens is that we just simply stop dreaming and setting big goals and expanding ourselves again, you know, maybe because of societal conditioning we just seem to have bought into this myth that, you know, as we get older, we slow down. Mm. As we get older, we, we are, you know, somehow 
like descending the mountain. If we think of it as a mountain, like your 20s and 30s, you know, you're, you're going up, you're reaching the pinnacle. And then somehow over 40, we have this idea that we're kind of winding down. Um, and, and, you know, that could come from a million different places. There could be a million different reasons why we feel that way. But I do think that that contributes to a lot of the feelings that people have in midlife where they just feel stuck. It's like, you know, I think whenever we feel stuck, it's because the outside of our life is not feeling aligned with who we are inside. Mm. And I think, you know, for many women, they get to midlife and it's like they've spent years, for example, as a mother. And then now their kids are grown and moving on. And so there it's a little disorienting because that identity now is has shifted and now they have to find a new identity and that's uncomfortable. Um, it could be, you know, my situation that you're you've identified as a wife for so long and then suddenly you're you're not somebody's wife anymore and you've got to recreate an identity as a single person. Um, maybe it's a career change. I, I think few of us get to our 40s and 50s without having experienced some major change. I mean, those are, the, you know, the years, I, I think 40 to 60 are probably the, the biggest, um, the years that women experience the greatest amount of change. So, so yes, that usually will force women to either feel stuck and feel like the best years of their lives are over, or it will motivate women to create a whole new identity and create a whole, you know, second chapter. Um, yeah. That's why I think these years are so important. I think they're really formative years, the same way that our teenage years are, or our early twenties. You know, I think, I think how we um, treat ourselves how we handle our wellness, how we handle our emotional wellness in these years really sets us up, you know, can set us up to, to have an amazing second half of life and really thrive or not. Yes. I think these, it really boils down to, you know, what are we doing now? And then what, you know, what effect will that have down the road? Yeah, that really struck a chord with me. I find with old people that either like really, really old people, people in their nineties, um, they're either really happy or really grumpy. Mm. And there is, I'm sure there's an in-between, but I know this just from flying. So I was in aviation for the first half of my twenties and you'd have these elderly people that were a ball of sunshine or mm -hmm. you'd have these elderly people that right. it was actually quite comical, was so grumpy all, all right, the time. Right. Like I hated life. What sort of mindset do you need to age powerfully? Like what you're speaking about, like how do you help people have that mindset? Um, I, I think by doing, you know, a lot of the work we spoke about, just helping people to understand the power of their choices. Mm -hmm. I do think our wellness is, is the foundation of everything. You know, I, I say that all the time um, and I truly believe it. I think that it is really difficult to age powerfully and to have a really healthy mindset if we're not taking care of ourselves physically. Um, and again, it goes back to that mind-body connection, but I think it's it's even deeper than that. I, I think really our, our body is, um, our health and wellness informs everything else we do. You know, it's mm -hmm. the reason why when we're feeling really good, when we've had a good night's sleep, you know, we're just not as on edge. We're not as likely to, you know, get aggravated, to snap at somebody. You know, I, I just think we don't always realize um, just what, just how important those things are, you know, not creating a lot of inflammation in the body with our diet, yes. not changing our brain chemistry with a lot of sugar, with a lot of caffeine, with a lot of alcohol, not, you know, be, moving our body, just moving energy in that way. I, I think these are very simple practices that have such a big effect on the way that we think and our mindset and, and kind of our mood. Um, so, so that's why I think I always start with the physical, you know, just yeah. feel better, just get yourself to a place where your, where your body, your nervous system isn't, isn't on high alert all the time, where you're getting good rest, where you're filling your body with good food. And you'll be amazed at how much easier it is at that point 
to change your mindset, mm, you know, and, yeah. and then vice versa. When you have a better mindset, then it's easier to keep up those healthy habits. So it becomes this beautiful cycle, but it really has to start, I believe, with the physical. No, that makes total sense. And I think a lot of people listening won't be surprised when we say, hey, sleep seven to nine hours of night, eat healthy most of the time, mm-hmm. go for the perimeter of the the grocery yeah. center and move often. But you alluded to it earlier that you kind of started with incremental steps. Mm-hmm. For somebody who's not sleeping well, they're not eating well, they know they're not, they're enjoying, you know, maybe a few too many bottles of wines. How would you help them set goals, but not overwhelm themselves in the process? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, um, it's it's actually I created a guide. So many people would ask me this very question that I created what I call the midlife glow up guide. It's seven days to your healthiest, most radiant self, and every day is just a different small step. So, for example, you know the first step might be hydration. Mm-hmm. Most of us are chronically dehydrated at, without even realizing it, without even thinking about it. So, you know, just Sips making it water. a point. That's right. <laughs> just making it a point to drink half our body weight in ounces every day, you know, that, that is so energizing. Um, and, and when people, you know, sometimes just that step alone, people are like, wow, I feel so much better. You know, I just, I do have more energy just from making sure that your body is hydrated. It, it's on a cellular level, you know, it, it improves the state of our body. So, so of course we're going to feel that in terms of our energy and then just, you know, slowly adding in those leafy greens, you know, adding in um, more fiber, adding in more protein. A lot of women, you know, don't, aren't eating enough. Um, And that's, and that's another important distinction to make, especially for women over 40, because we, we grew up with that calories in calories out model, Mm -hmm. right? Which, which we know there is, you know, tons of science to support the fact that that just simply does not work particularly for a woman over 40, but really I don't believe it works for anybody. Um, And the reason being that all calories are not created equally. Mm -hmm. So the way your body responds, the way your body metabolizes the calories that come from an apple, it's very different from the way your body metabolizes the calories that come from a cookie, Mm -hmm. right? So counting calories and that whole, that whole, you know, well, if, if I eat at a calorie deficit, I'll lose weight. It, it really doesn't work like that. And I think, you know, retraining ourselves to think about wellness differently um, is huge. So, so yeah, you know, just steps like that, like forget it, forget about calories. Let's, let's look at the quality of the calories you're eating and slowly let's make sure we're getting enough protein, getting enough fiber, hydrating, you know, every day moving a little bit and, Yes, eventually we want to work up to strength training and, and, you know, maintaining muscle mass and bone mass. But, but for somebody who's not ever moved, maybe it's just a 10 or 15 minute walk, you know, at some point, I I think start, I'm, I'm not a believer in overhauling everything. I really do think that in order for any healthy habits to stick um, and in order for, for them to make lasting change it's got to be, it's got to work within the context of our lives. So, you know, I'm a big believer in start small and just incrementally add, you know, add on, layer on healthy habits. And within a short period of time, you can create a very, what I call it, a hormone healthy lifestyle um, just by making these small changes. Yeah. I love, I love that you mentioned it's the context of where someone's at as to Mm -hmm. what's going to be overwhelming or not. And I do also love that you touched on calories in calories out because it's an oversimplification. There is validity Mm -hmm. to it, of course, because it's an exchange of energy, but the, the quality of the calories is so much more important than the quantity of the, Mm -hmm. the calories. Um, you touched on it a little bit, protein. Why is it Mm -hmm. so important for women at midlife? Well, you know, protein is a building block and every year after, I think it's about 38, I I forget what the, what the actual number is. We lose, you know, a considerable amount of muscle mass and bone mass every single year. And if we're not eating enough protein, not only is it harder for us to 
build that muscle and bone mass, uh, muscle mass back, but we will lose it that much faster. So protein is really important. Now, when someone is trying to lose weight, and a lot of women over 40 find themselves naturally gaining weight because meta the metabolism naturally slows a bit, usually the knee-jerk reaction is to cut calories. So they, they fill up on salads and things, and they're cutting out things like protein and fat, um, right. which, which is probably the worst thing we can do, especially at that stage of life. So, uh, you know, again, retraining ourselves a bit and understanding the value of protein and fat, you know, healthy fat um, is, is huge for a woman over 40, but, um, but yeah, pro I, I think, I think increasing the protein that we're eating has so many benefits from not just, you know, maintaining and, and building muscle mass, but it, it really has the ability to improve our metabolism so that we are, we are more efficiently and effectively metabolizing all the food that we're eating because we're keeping, you know, the protein is like stoking the fire of our metabolism. So it just keeps everything running so much better. And again, it's just not something that, you know, I've never been to a doctor who asked me what I was eating or how many grams of protein, you know, per day or per meal or, you know, how much fiber I was having. It's, it's, these are just conversations we don't typically have. Um, and so women get to this stage of life and they don't really understand kind of how they, how they can be eating in a way that will really set themselves up to age much stronger. And I think that's, that's the reframe too. Like, you know, as a culture, we focus on the number on the scale and we focus on the number inside our clothes. Mm -hmm. Right. But as we age, the goal is not to be thin, right? We don't want to be an older person who's thin and frail. We want to be strong. Yes. So, so, you know, again, it means retraining ourselves a bit to think about wellness in the second half of life a little bit differently. And, mm -hmm. and mind you, I, you know, I, I say the second half of life, I'm talking about over 40, right? Like anybody over 40 is, is probably in the second half of their life, right? You know, the math would indicate. So, so it, that's, that's pretty young, but yet I think we need to be cognizant of how we want to age. And I don't think aging, you know, quote unquote, thin is the goal. Aging right. strong is the goal. And, and yeah. if we make strength the priority, well, then yes, we want to be eating, you know, more protein and more healthy fat. And the funny thing about that, the thing that's sort of counterintuitive is that when we do that, when our body, you know, is a little more balanced hormonally, and when it's being fed, you know, protein and fat and things that are going to make us healthier and stronger, the irony or, or the, you know, the, the wonderful paradox is that Often women who have excess weight will find themselves naturally losing weight. I mean, it's just, you know, once we kind of balance the body out, the weight will come off and it'll come off much um, more easily mm. because we're, we're really, you know, boosting our metabolism in a healthy way and not just restricting calories and cutting a lot of things out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this advice is so transferable to even people who are in their 20s and 30s, because mm -hmm. if you focus on these things when you're younger, then they come second nature once you get to midlife and you get to focus on something, something different, you know, whether, you know, yeah. if you already are eating enough protein and building muscle mass, that's just like one extra thing you aren't developing on and you're developing on something else because life is always about growth. Um, yeah, my, my daughter is 21. And, yeah. and I'm always talking to her and her friends about food. And they're always asking me questions because, you know, good nutrition is good nutrition. I yeah. think the only thing that, that changes over 40 is that we really feel the effects of poor nutrition in, oh, in yeah. a much stronger way. You know, when you're 20, you can, you can compensate for poor sleep or you can compensate for too much caffeine or too much alcohol in a way that it gets harder to do as you get older. So, mm. you know, I'm always preaching to all of them about <laughs> good nutrition and good habits because what I'm doing, you know, it's it isn't just healthy for for a woman who's 54 like I am, but you know, that's that's how I would love for, you know, my kids to be eating and and to grow up 
with the, you know, with that knowledge, um, I, I think is a, a huge benefit that maybe, you know, some of us, my, some of us, my age, um, didn't necessarily have, we just didn't know as much back then about, you know, how to take care of the body. Hey, Holistic Fitness fam, a quick message from one of our sponsors, Ned. As you all know, I recommend good nutrition, movement, and stress management practices before supplementing so you know what type of supplementation that your body actually needs. For me, I supplement with very few products, but Ned is one of them. I'm a type A, high energy, ambitious business girly with massive goals. And sometimes I honestly just need to chill out and relax a bit. I've found that both Ned's de-stress and sleep blends fit in with my busy lifestyle and ambitious goals, but I was honestly not a big fan of CBD products before trying Ned, mostly because of the culture surrounding weed. I just didn't want something that was going to alter my state of mind so that I became much less of a goal getter or less ambitious. That was until I learned about full spectrum hemp and their benefits. Ned blends a chock full of premium CBD and a full spectrum hemp of active cannabinoids. Ned's full spectrum hemp oil nourishes the body's endocannabinoid system to, uh, to offer functional support for stress, sleep, inflammation, and balance. These products are science-backed, nature-based solutions that offer an alternative to prescription and over-the-counter drugs. All of Ned's products are... All of Ned's full spectrum hemp oil is extracted from USDA certified organic hemp plants grown by an independent farmer named Jonathan in Colorado. I'm obviously a big fan, but don't take just my word for it. Ned CBD products have over 2,000 five-star reviews and they work with incredible partners in the medical field like Dr. Caroline Leaf, Dr. Christian Gonzalez and Dr. Will Cole. Ned is providing Holistic Fitness podcast listeners a very special discount. If you'd like to give Ned a try, listeners get 15% off Ned products with the code Lori Lee, L-O-R-I-L-E-E. Thanks, Ned, for sponsoring the show and offering a natural remedy to bring balance to so many people's well-being. Yeah, and that's what it's all about. You want the next generation to be further ahead than you are because... You just want to give that to the next generation rather than um, having them all learn the hard way as, as well. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious about different metrics. So you did mention you we shouldn't be focusing on like the quantity of calories, the size of the dress, the number on the scale. What sort of mm -hmm. things would you say are better metrics to to track? Definitely inflammation. Okay. Um, I, I think, you know, as, particularly as we age, the body naturally becomes more inflamed. Aging is a process that <laughs> creates inflammation in the body because cells are not operating as efficiently. So I think, you know, there are um, blood tests that measure inflammation. That's, that's extremely beneficial to know whether you have inflammation in the body that you need to deal with. Um, you know, things like blood sugar levels, I think blood okay. sugar management and, and, you know, glucose monitoring can be extremely helpful to know how your body is metabolizing certain foods and the effect that that has on your blood sugar when you consume certain things, you know, obviously blood pressure, right? Cholesterol levels. And, and, you know, some of these are tests that can be performed in the doctor's office with an annual physical. And then there are, you know, other tests and assessments that, that, we can do on our own, you know, for example, um, how is your resting heart rate? You know, most of us uh, don't have any idea of what our resting heart rate is, but you know, if first thing in the morning, we measure it for 60 seconds, we can then see, you know, when we're working out and we're working out hard, how our heart rate goes up and then how quickly do, do we recover? You know, th that's important information to determine kind of your level of fitness. And then just, lifestyle habits, you know, how much water am I drinking? Am I dehydrated? Um, you know, how, how, how many glasses of alcohol do I drink in a typical week? How much caffeine am I consuming? Um, you know, what kinds of supplements, if any, am I taking? And, and, you know, is that something I need to explore? I, I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of our assessments can be as simple as how do I feel? Mm. You know, is my sleep broken up? I mean, for me, I noticed a pattern that when I would have a glass of wine with dinner, my sleep was really dis disrupted. Mm. Um, and when I didn't, I was able to get seven or eight 
eight hours of sleep uninterrupted. So, you know, for me, tuning into that highlighted the pattern that, you know, alcohol was really breaking up my sleep. And that's the case for a lot of women. Um, I think sleep is huge. It's, it's, you know, a friend of mine calls it like putting your body through the washing machine. <laughs> you know, it's when all of our cells repair and rebuild and, and it's very cleansing for the body. So we don't realize the effect that poor sleep has on, you know, everything else, every other system of the body. So, um, you know, so that's, that's certainly an assessment we can do on our own. We can just simply question, okay, what's the quality of my sleep? What's my sleep hygiene like? And then, you know, how many hours am I getting on average uh, of, of good quality sleep? Mm, those are really great questions to ask yourself. Like what's my blood sugar levels? How much water am I getting? How much caffeine am I having? And if you make a change, how do I feel after that change? Mm -hmm. I personally have a whoop. They're not, um, sponsored at all but I love it so much <laughs> because there's there's this journal that you can do and after a certain amount of time so whether it's simple as like wearing a mask at night or taking CBD it tells you what impacts your recovery better and for me personally the three things that are good for my recovery one CBD oil another one's like when I get really good sleep obviously and then another one is my my period when I menstruate, mm -hmm. for some reason, that's good for my, for my recovery. But the things yeah. that are really bad is like a weighted blanket and alcohol, obviously. <laughs> but, right. um, but oh, yeah, it's just really I haven't heard of that one. I haven't yeah, heard of that one. W-H-O-O-P and the way that oh, they, um, that. yeah, have a look at some of their research as well. They measure it, your recovery based on heart rate variability as well. So, oh, which, okay. which I find really cool, but, um, I guess like everyone would be different because I could imagine a weighted blanket would be good for some people's recovery, mm -hmm. but it's not, not good for mine, but the, the types of stuff that you were speaking about just then made me realize like, oh, I do that in a really you're easy, tracking quantifiable yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and things like the aura, aura ring, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that they correctly. Partner I think, with aura, yeah. Oh, okay. Cause there, there are definitely tools that can make tracking this stuff, you know, a lot easier, easier yeah. and that's, and that's great. But, um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, we, we just, aren't always aware or, yeah. you know, tuned into those things. And, and that's really how we should be thinking about our wellness, you know, yes. much, much more important than, than, as I said, the number on the scale or, or, you know, the number inside our clothing, it just, we, we don't get a lot of information from those numbers. So you, you might weigh, you know, 130 pounds, but we don't know how much of that is coming from muscle. We don't know how much of that is fat. And if, if there is visceral adipose tissue, which is the worst kind of fat, it's the fat around the belly that kind of wraps around the organs. It's very dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. The number on the scale doesn't tell us that. Now I do know um, that they make now the bioimpedance scales, mm -hmm. which do kind of break down body composition in that way. So, so, you know, there are, like you were saying with the whoop or the, the bioimpedance scales, there are tools now um, you know, to, to get a little more information. But I think that's the key is that, you know, we, we don't just want a number. We want what's, what is that number made up of? You know, what's, what's, what information is underlying that number? That's really, you know, what's going to tell us where we are and, and what changes might be necessary or, you know, or um, advisable. Yes, absolutely. And I do like that your intuition or critical thinking comes into account as well. You just can't use a tool for everything. And that's what you were alluding to at the start of this podcast. Okay. Why am I thinking this? Why have I not had a good sleep? What if I cut out, out caffeine? How does that make me feel? Um, and those are all really important questions to ask yourself because bioindividuality is really important as well. Sure. And, and another reason why we have to really advocate for ourselves, because even if we have the best doctor in the world who is very knowledgeable about these things, there isn't a cookie cutter approach that will apply to every woman. Exactly. So we still really need to educate ourselves and, and, you know, just have that awareness on our own. Yeah, that makes sense. We are coming to a close here today, Karen, but I do have like a really random question for you. Um, I love your business name, Welligan. Why did you choose that? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Everybody loves the name and everybody always asks me that. So in, in my mind, it's the joining together of two concepts that I think 
are really the heart of a well-lived life. So it's this idea of wellness, you know, body, mind, and spirit, because I, I define wellness as, you know, having a healthy body, a, um, you know, a clear mind and a tranquil spirit. But it's also this idea of elegance. And by elegance, I mean simplicity, uh, discernment, valuing quality over quantity, and just really living with integrity and character and confidence. And I think that if we have both of those things in place, it, it really does set us up for a very well-lived life. Um, and, and so that's why, you know, I, I, I use the term well against or well against woman. Um, again, it's, it's just prioritizing both wellness and this idea of living really elegantly and simple, simply with a real attention paid to our values. You know, what, what is it that we value and how can I align my life so that everything I do is a reflection of those values? I love the thought and creativity you put into that and the meaning behind it. It's really mm -hmm. well explained and makes total sense. Uh, thank you. Great. Speaking of your future self, um, we do have a final question on this podcast. And when you were speaking about the future self, I'm like, this is hilarious. Um, our <laughs> final right? question is if you were speaking to your 20 year old self right now, so someone your daughter's age, um, it, but mm. it's you, you at that point in your yeah. life, you know, 20, 24 years ago, 34 years ago, um, what one sentence of advice would you give her? I, I think what I would say and what I find myself telling my own daughter all the time is um, just reminding her of her own power. I, I never felt um, nearly as powerful in my younger years as I feel now. And I realized it was never a function of anything but my own awareness. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I would love every 20 year old woman to feel way more powerful and, and more in control of their future and their, you know, sort of destiny than they think they are. Yeah. No pun intended. That's very yeah. empowering. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is very empowering. Um, right. cause I, I feel that deeply as well. I definitely didn't feel powerful when I was 20, you know, yeah. we, we felt, um, don't know what the word is maybe impulsive is the word like ability to make choices but not necessarily mm -hmm. powerful ones <laughs> right and and many of our choices I think were in response to other things right yeah, you were making a choice but you had everybody else's needs and desires and you know in mind um and I don't know how many choices we make at 20 that are purely driven by you know what do I want mm. you know unapologetically what do I want what do I dream of you know, that, that's a, that's a really powerful mindset, but you know, not one that, that um, it, it's one that seems to come with age more often than not. Yeah. Yeah. The school of hard knocks teaches yeah. us that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's been wonderful that's having right. you on the podcast today, Karen. I'm sure many people want to learn more about Welligant. So where can we all find you? So my website is welligantwoman.com and I have, um, you know, many, many free resources um, for visitors to the, to the site, one of which I, I spoke about the midlife glow up guide. Um, and I'm, I also have a podcast called well, well again, woman redefining midlife. So a lot of what we talked about are, you know, the kinds of things that I talk about, we, we talk beauty and style and health and wellness and all the things that uh, us over 40 ladies are, uh, you know, thinking about and, uh, and then, you know, Instagram and Facebook and the socials. So I'm around. <laughs> oh, it's been wonderful to have you on the podcast today. And I'm sure that, you know, many people head to your your podcast. We'll pop that in the, the show notes as well. I, I'm sure that so many people are interested in, um, we've spoken a lot about the well side, but even the mm -hmm. elegant side of things um, would be, would be awesome to hear about. So uh, thanks thank so much you. for joining today. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. No worries. And for everyone joining, whether you are cleaning the house while listening, driving in the car, whatever you're up to today, eat well, move well, breathe well. And until next time, keep shining. Mm -hmm.